Hi, welcome to Botany 101. I'm Angela Nishimoto. Today we're going to talk about life, okay, and the characteristics of life. So one of the characteristics of life is that living things have composition and structure. Okay, here we have a cell. So living things are also made up of cells, one or more cells, all right? The components of all cells actually are three, even though it looks like there are more than three different things in this cell, but all cells have three separate components. One of them is a plasma membrane or the cell membrane that bounds the living part of the cell. It separates the internal environment of the cell and the external world, all right? The second component of our cells are the cytoplasm, okay, which are, is a liquid inside with um, bodies suspended in it, and this one has a lot of different organelles, the chloroplasts, the mitochondria, okay? But the cytoplasm is a second component of all cells. Now, the third component of all cells is genetic material, and in eukaryotic cells, of which plant cells are, are among them, okay? The genetic material is in the form of linear chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell. Okay, so we have the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, and genetic material. That's three components of all cells. Okay, now the second characteristic of life that we're talking about today is growth, right? Here we have some seedlings, clearly, okay, result of sexual reproduction. Okay, but here you can see that they're growing, okay? And because they actually probably came from the same parent, they have similar genetic makeups, but they're also different from each other. Okay, so one component that actually makes up growth, what, how big the plant will grow, how fast it will grow, is its genetic composition, okay, that it gets from its parent or parents, all right? A second component is the environment, okay? The environment in which that it grows. So you can actually have one plant next to another, and if one actually gets more sunlight, gets a little bit more nutrients, gets more water, it will probably grow larger than the one next to it, even if they come from similar, or even if they're clones of each other, okay? Now the third characteristic of life that we're covering today is reproduction, okay? All living things do reproduction. Okay, here's a germinating seedling, all right, and it's a result of sexual reproduction where you have one male parent, which is a sperm donor, one female parent, which is the egg donor, okay, the sperm and egg come together to form a new individual, all right, that's sexual reproduction where we have two parents, all right, now when, and plants can also do asexual reproduction as well. They can actually reproduce through their leaf or their stem or their root, okay, and asexual reproduction has to do with one parent instead of two. So plants can do sexual reproduction with two parents or they can do asexual reproduction with only one parent. Okay, another characteristic of life is that we have a response to stimuli, all right? So here we have a, an image of a plant, okay? And you can't really see it in this image, but it's actually responding to unidirectional source of light. So the light is on this side somewhere, and the plant is actually bending to bend toward light, okay? What actually happens is at the very tip of the stem, you have hormones being produced, okay? And when there's a unidirectional source of light, it actually translocates to this side, the dark side of the stem, Okay. And that side actually has more cell elongation, so the cells grow bigger. And because the cells on this side grow bigger and the ones on this side grow smaller or not as big, the, the stem bends toward the light. Okay. That's actually been um, figured out by plant physiologists in the past. Okay. Now another kind of response is stimulus. Okay. If you actually to uh, get a pin and stick it in a pin cushion, you won't get a reaction, right? A pin cushion is a non-living thing. But if you actually get a pin and stick it into a person, you can bet you're going to get a reaction from them, right? They're going to get all excited, okay, right? Okay, so uh, you're going to get a reaction from an animal for sure or a person for sure. But if you actually stick a pin into a plant, what will happen? 
okay? If you stick a pin into a plant and it hits a, a tissue that actually transports food in the plant, okay, what can happen is within maybe five seconds of the pin being stuck into it and making a hole in it, okay, the phloem or the food conducting tissue will actually f form something called callos, which is something that will plug up the hole. Okay, and not just that, is that soon after that, there will be some undifferentiated tissue developing at the wound site, which is called a callus, C-A-L-L-U-S. You know, so in a plant, un uh, undifferentiated wound tissue is called a callus. Okay, so you can see that there's a difference between uh, how an animal would respond and how a plant would respond, but still, plants still do respond to stimulus, even though their uh, response tends to be slower. Okay. Now another thing is plants have metabolism or living things have metabolism. Okay. Right here in the center, we have the pathway for glycolysis, which is the first stage in what we call cellular respiration. Okay. So uh, metabolism is all the biochemical reactions that happen within a living thing. All right. And plants and animals and fungi undergo respiration, which is an uh, energy releasing kind of reaction. And this is glycolysis, where you start off with a molecule of glucose, which is a monosaccharide. We'll get into that a little later in today's lecture. Okay. And after certain enzymes do their work on this glucose and its products, okay, it becomes fructose diphosphate. All right. And then this splits into two, uh, three carbon. Uh, phosphoglyceraldehydes, okay? And eventually, after some changes and the formation of something called NADH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or reduced nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is an electron carrier, just remember it as an electron carrier in cellular respiration, all right? And also, you have the formation of ATP, which is a currency of energy in the cell, Okay, then what you end up with is two molecules or two molecules of three carbon pyruvic acid. So you started off in glycolysis with a six carbon glucose and after many different reactions, biochemical reactions, you end up with two pyruvic acids at the end of glycolysis, which is the first stage of uh, aerobic cellular respiration. All right, now this here is actually a, sort of like a, um, simplified depiction, and it's a very good image, all right, of photosynthesis. Okay, photosynthesis is an energy harvesting kind of reactions, okay? So photosynthesis happens in two parts. You have the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, all right? And so light from the sun hits a leaf, which is the main organ of photosynthesis. Remember, photo is light, synthesis means to join. Okay, and water is split by light and gives off oxygen gas. Remember, the plants actually give off oxygen gas, which we need to actually do our cellular respiration. Okay, and so the light reactions generate another kind of substance called NADPH, which is another electron carrier, and ATP, the currency of energy in the cell, which goes to the Calvin cycle. Okay, and during the Calvin cycle, inorganic carbon in the form of car carbon dioxide is fixed, okay, eventually to form uh, sugars, all right? So um, respiration and photosynthesis are two kinds of uh, biochemical reactions that occur in living cells. There's also digestion, okay, digestion actually takes large insoluble molecules and transforms them into smaller and soluble molecules. Okay, so from large insoluble to smaller and soluble, okay? And there's also a simulation where you have raw materials that are actually converted by many biochemical reactions into the components of the cell, okay? So we have respiration, we have photosynthesis, we have digestion, and we have assimilation. Those are four main different kinds of metabolic reactions, okay, in the cell. Okay, now living things also exhibit movement, okay, such as sleeping grass, what we call sleeping grass in Hawaii, 
okay? The leaves of sleeping grass will actually, if you touch them lightly or if they're brushed, they will actually close up, all right? Traps of uh, bladder warts shut, okay, to trap their prey. These are carniv so-called carnivorous plants, all right? But most of the actions or most of the movement of plants are tend to be slow reactions and like twining movements as the plant grows. So it's something that you can't really see with your unaided eye, but if you did um, time-lapse photography, you could actually see that the plant is moving. Okay, so all plants actually have some kinds of growth movements, all right? Okay, then we have the fact that plants have complex organization. Okay, so you know that uh, plants are made up of cells because all living things are made up of cells and plants are living things, all right? And cells are also made up of molecules. Okay, there are more than one trillion molecules in each cell, okay? Bacteria are actually the smallest and most uh, simple type of cells, okay? But each bacterial cell has more than 600 different kinds of proteins. Isn't that an amazing fact? Okay, then that's a bacterial cell, not even a eukaryotic cell, but a prokaryotic cell. Okay. Now, plants also have adaptation. Okay, they respond to air, okay, light, water, and soil conditions. Okay, and also after generations of natural selection, okay, plants are adapted to their environment, such as this plant is clearly adapted to a highlight environment. There's not really many things going around it. It actually looks like a crack in a sidewalk or something. Yeah. Anyway, so plants, after many generations of natural selection, are adapted to their environment. So you can have plants such as dandelions, which most consider to be a weed. Dandelions grow all over the world in all kinds of conditions. Okay. So what is a weed? A weed is just a plant that's growing in a place that you don't want it to grow. Okay, and dandelions are actually useful. You can eat the greens, all right, and you can also make wine from dandelions, right? Anyway, so dandelions are one extreme example of a kind of plant adaptation to many environments. And then as another example, we could have the Haleakala silver sword, which naturally grows only on Hale in Haleakala crater on Maui. Right? So you have the extremes from dandelions to the Haleakala silver swords in terms of their adaptation to environments. The Haleakala silver sword, of course, is adapted to a very narrow range of environmental conditions. Okay? Now we're going to get into the chemical and physical bases of life. Okay? So um, life is made up of matter, matter is the stuff of the universe. Okay, they come in the form of solid, liquid, and gas. And here's some nice images of solid water, which you know as ice, liquid water, okay, and also vapor, water vapor, okay, which is a gas, okay. So all matter is in one of these three states, right? Now also matter also occupies space, takes up space, as solids, liquids, and gases do. And they also have mass. Mass is roughly equivalent to weight, okay? So mass is about what something weighs, all right? Now living things are also composed of elements, right? And there are uh, 92 naturally occurring elements, okay? And each of them have their own symbol. Okay, so next we're gonna show you the periodic table. Okay, we're going to go over a few different kinds of um, elements, okay, uh, the ones that need concern us, all right? So here you have uh, an element called hydrogen abbreviated with an H, all right? You can see it has a one here, one here. That's the atomic number. That refers to the number of protons that hydrogen has in its nucleus, okay? And this here is its mass number, okay? Its mass number is generally a combination of the weight of the protons and the weight of the neutrons, all right? But hydrogen does not have any neutrons, so its mass weight is one, okay? 
You know, if there's one proton in the nucleus, there will be one electron, okay, which has a negative charge. Protons have a positive charge for hydrogen. Okay, so remember that. We're going to go back to that a little bit later. Okay, another atom of interest or element of interest is carbon. Okay, carbon has an atomic number of six. That means that it has six protons in its nucleus, six electrons in its orbitals. Okay, and it generally has a mass number of about 12. So generally in the nucleus of a carbon atom, you will have six protons and about six neutrons, depending on the isotope or the variation of carbon that we're talking about. Okay, now nitrogen is also an important uh, element to know about. Okay, it has an atomic number of seven or seven protons in its nucleus. Okay, so the number of protons in its nucleus is important because the number of protons equal the number of electrons, okay? And the number of electrons actually determine how elements bond to each other or how atoms bond to each other or, or if they do form bonds, okay? Because generally if you have a certain amount of electrons in the outer uh, shell, the uh, element is unstable and will tend to form bonds. Okay, now oxygen has an atomic number of eight, so it has eight protons in its nucleus, eight electrons in its orbitals. Okay, another element I want to show you is sodium here. Okay. Sodium has 11, okay, an atomic number of 11, so that means how many protons in its nucleus? Okay, think about it, okay, how many electrons does it have? Okay, now we also have uh, chlorine here, okay, which has 17 protons in its nucleus, okay, 17 electrons. Okay, so those are some of the elements I want you to know about. Some other important elements in terms of uh, organic chemistry or, or organic compounds are uh, phosphorus, okay, and let's see, potassium and sulfur as well as some others, okay? Now, the chemical and physical basis of life, okay, so atoms are the smallest unit of an element that has all the attributes of the element, okay? And atoms are so tiny, so incredibly small, that it wasn't until the mid-1980s that they de developed electron microscopes powerful enough so that you could actually visualize an atom. They're so small, okay? Now the atom is actually made up of an atomic nucleus, okay? That's one part of it. And in the atomic nucleus, we talked about this before, you have the proton or protons, and protons have a positive charge, in the nucleus also, you have the neutron or neutrons, which have no charge. Okay, so do you remember what this is? This, what element this is or what atom this is? Remember six protons in the nucleus? Okay, six uh, electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is um, carbon, right? This is a carbon atom. All right, and, and this is important, how many electrons are in the outermost orbitals okay, or the outermost shell, because that's actually telling you how many bonds it needs to make. Okay, so we'll go back into this later. Just remember that carbon has six protons, six electrons, so always remember that in an atom, charges are balanced. Okay, for every proton in, uh, in an element, Okay, you have the same number of electrons in the atom, okay? Now you also have the orbitals or the shells, and that's where the electrons reside, as you can see. This is a planetary model of an atom, of a carbon atom, okay? And this isn't exactly how carbon atoms really are, but it actually makes it easier for us to have this as a model to look at so we can see the discrete shells. So one of the things you see is that in the innermost shell, the innermost shell is actually full when it has two electrons, one, two. So the innermost shell is full. Okay, it's fulfilled, it's full, all right? Now the outermost shell, 
of this carbon atom has four electrons, okay? And in bonding, or what, uh, in uh, the outermost shell, in this case, in the second shell, the uh, element wants, or the atom wants to have eight electrons, and that has to do with bonding, which we'll go into in just a little bit, okay? So electrons are actually so small, okay, that generally the mass of an electron is disregarded. Okay, they're like over a thousand, thousand times smaller than a proton or a neutron in terms of its mass. Okay, and remember that opposite charges, electrons have a negative charge. Remember that opposite charges attract, so the negatively charged electrons in the orbitals or in the shells are um, uh, chemically uh, drawn to the positive charges in the uh, nucleus, okay, where the protons are. And remember that neutrons, like neutral, have no charge to them, okay? Now, molecules are a combination of elements, okay? So most elements do not exist as single atoms, all right? So a molecule is two or more atoms bonded together. Okay, this is actually looking at molecular oxygen. Okay, oxygen has um, eight protons, eight electrons, right? So there's two in the innermost orbital. Okay, and there's six in the outermost or orbital of an oxygen atom. So oxygen has a tendency to form two bonds to make the eight that it needs in its outer orbital. So one oxygen will double bond with another oxygen to form molecular oxygen or oxygen gas, okay? Now another thing is that if you have two or more elements in a set ratio, that's what you call a compound, such as glucose or fructose, C6H12O6, okay? Those are in a set ratio, so that would, that's something that you would call a compound, okay? Now, valence is a combining capacity, which is based on the number of electrons, okay, like we just talked about. Okay, now bonds and ions. So bonds actually form molecules, okay? Well, that has to do with the number of electrons in the outer orbital. Okay, that's where bonds are made and bonds are broken. Okay, so remember when we said that hydrogen has an atomic number of one, so it has one proton, right? It also has one electron, right? And because it only has one electron, okay, it's not fulfilled, it's not filled. It wants to have two electrons in its orbital, in this inner orbital, or, that, or the only orbital that hydrogen has, okay? Now, oxygen, as we just talked about, has eight protons in a nucleus and eight electrons. It's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it has six in its outer orbital, okay? So it tends to make two bonds. So generally, if you have two atoms of hydrogen, okay, they can actually go and share an electron pair with uh, the oxygen, and if you had a, a, the other hydrogen, it could share an electron pair with the oxygen. Then the oxygen would have eight in its outer orbital, and hydrogen would have two. The two hydrogens would have two in the orbital since it would share electron pairs, okay? So what we talked about just now was covalent bonding, okay, where electrons are shared between one atom and another. Okay, this is the strongest kind of bond, okay, between atoms. Okay, so we have here um, atomic hydrogen, hydrogen atoms, each of them with one proton, one electron, okay? So in um, the air, in our atmosphere, hydrogen tends to form a single bond with another hydrogen to form hydrogen gas, like your molecular hydrogen. Okay, now here you have carbon with its six protons, six electrons, right? Four um, electrons in its outer orbital, and each of these hydrogens have one electron each. So each of these hydrogens will tend to bond with the carbon, so the carbon can make one bond with each of these four hydrogens, okay? So then everybody's happy 
you know, all the uh, electron shells are fulfilled. Everybody's happy. So you have one carbon and four hydrogens making methane, okay? And then just what we just talked about, about water, okay? Hydrogen having one proton each, okay? One electron each. Oxygen having uh, six protons, six electrons, okay? So uh, hydrogen and um, oxygen tend to form H2O. So what is H2O? Okay, can you, can you think about that for a sec? H2O is water, right? Okay. Okay, now ionic bonding occurs between ions. Okay, a good example of that is sodium chloride. Okay, so Na stands for sodium. It actually stands for natrium, which is a Latin name for sodium. Okay, sodium is Greek and chloride, chloride. Okay, so what happens? Do you remember when we looked at it earlier? That sodium has 11, right? 11 protons in its nucleus, 11 electrons. So here we have two in the inner orbital, eight in the second orbital, and one in the outer orbital, all by its lonesome self, okay? Now chlorine actually has 17 uh, protons in its nucleus, 17 electrons. Okay, so it has two electrons in its inner orbital, eight electrons in its middle orbital, then it has seven in its outer orbital. So what happens? Okay, so what happens is that the sodium atom donates an electron and a negative charge, because electrons are basically mostly just negative charges, and donates the electron to the chlor what is now the chloride ion, okay? So then it is, uh, the sodium has lost a negative charge, so there's a net positive charge, okay, on the, the sodium, okay? This is a sodium ion, also known as cation, okay? A cation actually has a positive charge or more than one positive charge to it, okay? Whereas the electron being donated to the chlorine actually makes a chloride ion, it actually added a negative charge to it, so it's an anion, or a negatively charged ion, all right? Then because these are oppositely charged, the positively charged sodium and the negatively charged chloride ions, they're attracted to each other, okay? So they would tend to form like a lattice structure, okay? So sodium chloride is what? What is it? Okay? It's actually table salt, all right? Okay, so um, now the third kind of bonding is a hydrogen bond, okay? It's the weakest kind of bonding, and it's also a secondary bond, okay? It actually is a bond that occurs between molecules, okay? So here we have some water molecules. We just talked about how water uh, molecules are actually formed has to do with electron behavior, number of electrons in the orbitals, and because when you have uh, different numbers of electrons in the outer orbital, okay, if you have, say, one, or if you have uh, six, or if you have four, or if you have seven, okay, what happens is that the atom is unstable. When they say unstable, it just means that it has a tendency to make bonds or break bonds. It has a tendency to change. You, know, you can actually say that about, um, relationships and about people too, that if they're changeable, yeah, they, they can be kind of unstable, okay? So what these uh, water molecules do, okay, so when they form these water molecules, right, it actually lends stability to both the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms, okay? Now what happens with these hydrogen bonds, okay, is that generally you have the positively charged end called the hydrogen end of the molecule, all right, attracted to the negatively charged part of the oxygen atom, okay? Because what happens is that oxygen is the most ele electronegative of all the elements, so oxygen has a tendency to pull electrons toward itself, so the electrons that are shared between the oxygen and the two hydrogens tend to be more toward the oxygen side of the molecule, okay? So on that side of the molecule, on the oxygen, oxygen side of the molecule tends to have a slight negative charge to it, 
okay? And because on that side of the molecule, you have a slight negative charge, the hydrogen side of the molecule, you can see that the mo molecule is not symmetrical, right? So the hydrogens are on the other side of the molecule, and they have a slight positive charge to them. So if we can go back to the, um, to the slides, okay? You can see that the uh, hydrogen atoms here have a little bit of a slight positive charge, which are attracted to the slight neg slightly negatively charged part of another water molecule. Okay, so generally these hydrogen bonds are weak bonds. Okay, they can be broken by changes in temperature, they can be broken by changes in pH, or potential hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, and they tend to be actually depicted with these dots, or ellipses, or with dashed lines, because it's a weak bond, okay? Oh, by the way, if you have any questions about anything we're talking about right now, okay, please do not hesitate to either phone me in my office during office hours or email me. Okay, if anything's unclear, if you're stuck on something, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, we can go over it. You can either contact me by email or through the phone, or you can uh, come to my office and see me, which is what I would like, okay? We, we, we tend to do our office hours and nobody comes to visit us, you know? Everybody's too busy, okay? Now, acids, bases, and salts. Okay, so water, okay, water, H2O, right? In solution, that actually dissociates sometimes and because, becomes a hydrogen ion, which in essence is a proton. It's actually a hydrogen atom that has lost its electron and hydroxyl ions, which is an oxygen bonded to one hydrogen with a net negative charge. So you have a, a, a hydrogen ion and a hydroxyl ion here, okay? So generally in solution, okay, water tends to dissociate into hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions, okay? So pure water actually has exactly the same number of hydrogen ions as hydroxyl ions, okay? And uh, so acid substances tend to be sour, like um, lemon juice, like cranberry juice. Okay, they're sour. And acids also release hydrogen ions. And here's a battery, so battery acid or nitric acid, okay, is actually uh, something that is a strong acid and it releases hydrogen ions, okay? So acids are sour and they release hydrogen ions, okay? Whereas bases are slippery, okay, bases are slippery, and what they do is they either release hydroxyl ions and they accept hydrogen ions, okay? All right, so acids are sour and release hydrogen ions and bases are slippery and they release hydroxyl ions or they accept hydrogen ions, okay? Now, um, soils and fluids and cells, the acidity or alkalinity, okay, so if something's acid or basic, another word for basic is alkaline, okay, so acidity and alkalinity will affect plants, you know, planted in certain soils. There are some plants that like acidic soil, some plants that prefer a little alkalinity, some, and most plants prefer soils in neutral pH, around neutral. Okay, something like 6.8 to maybe 8.2, something like that, pH. And we'll go into that in a, a little bit, okay? So the pH scale, okay, goes from 0 to 14, okay? So between pH 4 and pH 3, there's a tenfold increase in the number of available hydrogen ions, okay? So low pH pH 0 up to pH, uh, up to below pH 7 is acid, okay, so low pH is acid, okay, high pH is basic or alkaline, okay, so from above 7 to 14, okay, is uh, high pH, right, and that's alkaline or basic conditions, okay, so vinegar has about a pH of about 3, Okay, and egg white has a pH of about eight. Okay, now acid rain actually has a pH that is either 4.5 or less, which is pretty acid when you think about it. And acid rain has been blamed for uh, damage to plants, crops, okay, damage to forests, damages to lakes and rivers, 
Okay, also architecture, you know, so like the Parthenon in Athens due to the air pollution, you know, due to all the automobiles and all the industrial waste going into the air that actually causes acid rain, that's what they think causes acid rain anyway, right? So uh, acid rain is a bad thing, it really is, okay? And, and it'll actually mar and deface architectural and sculptural treasures like all those uh, caryatids on the Parthenon you know, in Athens, okay? So acid rain is not a good thing. It will damage plants and soils, buildings, sculptures, forests, water, okay? Not a good thing at all, okay? Now, so pH 7 is neutral. So pH 7 is a, a pH of pure water, okay? And pH uh, more than 7 to 14 is basic. Okay, so generally if you combine an acid and a base, what you'll get is water and a salt. Okay, for example, okay, you have a strong acid and hydro hydrogen, chloride, hydrogen chloride acid, okay, and you have sodium hydroxide as a strong base. Okay, so the hydrogen from the hydrogen chloride and the um, hydroxyl from the sodium hydroxide will combine to form water. Okay, and the, and the chloride okay, from um, HCl and the sodium from NaOH will form salt. Okay, this is what you call table salt. Okay. Now, energy is the ability to do work. Okay. And work includes growth, reproduction, movement, repair, and other activities of living things. And on Earth, the sun is the ultimate source of energy. Okay? Almost all our energy comes from the sun. Okay? Now, thermodynamics is a study of energy and its conversions from one form to another. Okay? So let's go into the laws of thermodynamics. Okay, the first law of thermodynamics is that the energy in the un universe is constant. What that means is that you can neither create energy nor can you destroy it, okay? You can only convert it from one form to another. You cannot create energy and you cannot destroy it, okay? So some kinds of energy include chemical energy that can be converted into electrical energy. And electrical energy, of course, can be converted to heat or to light, okay? Now the second law of thermodynamics okay, has to do with uh, energy conversions, okay, so when energy is converted from one form to another, the useful energy to the system is lost, okay, for example, that we can use an automobile analogy, okay, if you have a car, okay, and most people do drive cars even now, okay, even though we're getting to get to the emergency state in terms of our uses of fossil fuels, all right, but if you have a car, right, do you know that uh, what percent of the energy and the gasoline that you put into it is actually converted into motion in your car or using the radio or turning on the air conditioner, okay? Think of the gasoline and all the money that you spend on the gasoline, okay? So only 25% of the energy in the gasoline molecule is actually converted to energy to move the car right? Only 25%, right? So as you can see, some energy is lost to the system, okay? Some of it is ex ex extruded as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, okay, sulfur, um, uh, light, heat, okay? Some of these different things that come from that, okay? So what you have is only 25% or one quarter one quarter out of every dollar of gasoline that you put into your car is actually converted to moving your car, okay? And 75% literally goes up in spunk, okay? So when energy is converted from one form to another, useful energy is lost, okay? Now we also have forms of energy. You have kinetic energy, which is energy of movement, Okay. Then you have potential energy, which has to do with energy of position. 
Okay, so uh, a rider of a bicycle at the top of a hill has lots of potential energy due to their position on top of the hill or even a runner on top of the hill has a lot of potential energy due to their position. Now, energy of position also has to do with uh, molecules. There's actually uh, energy held in the chemical bonds that actually bond one atom to another, okay? So that's actually a form of potential energy, okay, in the chemical bonds between one atom and another. Okay, now, uh, the chemical components of cells, okay, so the cytoplasm and the structures within it, okay? So this is the chemical components of the living part of the cell, the cytoplasm and the structures, the organelles, you know, such as the chloroplast, such as the mitochondria, okay, such as the ER, and et cetera, which we will be going over in a future lecture, so don't panic, okay, we're going to actually cover it in quite some detail before your quiz on it or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you some previews before we actually get into some of the um, basic stuff we need to get into, okay? So 96% of cytoplasm and the structures within it are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So 90% C-H-O-N, almost like somebody's name, okay? Another 3% is phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur, okay, in terms of the chemical components of the cell. And then 1% is calcium, iron, magnesium, sodium, chlorine, copper, manganese, cobalt, and zinc, and others. So here's a nice kind of pie chart showing that 96% CHON in, uh, uh, inside of the cell Okay, the living part of the cell. About 3% is uh, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and then about 1% is all the others, uh, calcium, ion, iron, etc. Okay. Now generally, um, the components of cells are made up of large molecules with a carbon backbone. Okay, that means that they're organic, all right? So all the chemical reactions that happen in living things is based on organic compounds. Organic compounds are large molecules with a carbon backbone. Now, some ex uh, exceptions to the fact that uh, molecules with ca carbon in it are all organic. Carbon dioxide okay, is inorganic and so is sodium bicarbonate. That's also considered to be inorganic but most of the other molecules with carbon in it are considered to be organic compounds, okay? And if a compound doesn't have carbon in it, it's considered to be inorganic, all right? Now, generally, these large molecules are made up of smaller molecules, okay? So a monomer is a small molecule, as in this three-unit molecule that we see here, okay? and uh, uh, so monomers are single units, okay, and polymers are monomers joined together in covalent bonding. Poly, poly means many, like Polynesia means many island, okay, polymer means many unit, okay. So the four different kinds of large molecules with carbon backbones that are called the macromolecules of life are the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the nucleic acids, okay? So the molecules of life. The carbohydrates are the most abundant compounds in nature. They're made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? Monosaccharides tend to have three to seven carbons in their backbone, okay? And they include glucose and fructose, right? And disaccharides, okay, have two sugar units, and sucrose is actually a disaccharide. Let's go back to the monosaccharides, okay? Glucose is actually the product from photosynthesis, and it's a main energy source in the cell, okay? Fructose comes from fruits, 
and both glucose and fructose have the same uh, chemical formula, C6H12O6, okay, but they have uh, different um, arrangements of the components of the molecule, so they're called isomers. So glucose and fructose are isomers of each other. Okay, now sucrose is a glucose and a fructose combined in covalent bonding, all right? So, uh, so uh, sucrose is actually the form of sugar that is transported through the plants, all right? And this is the form of sugar that you see in sugar beets and also sugar cane, all right? Now we also have polysaccharides, okay? So they include starches, Okay, starches. Okay, so we have a monosaccharide, glucose. Here have a disaccharide, which is a glucose and a fructose, so a sucrose molecule. Okay, and here's a polysaccharide, or amylose. Okay, so starch is made up of amylose and amylopectin. Okay, so amylose starch is actually glucose molecules covalently bonded to each other in a certain kind of uh, conformation. Okay, so starches, of course, are very important for us for food, wheat, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, cassava, yams, all have a lot of starches in them, okay? And this we can digest fairly easily, but cellulose, which is another polysaccharide, actually forms the basis of the cell wall external to the living part of the cell. And cellulose for us is not digestible, okay? We cannot digest this. Okay, so termites, okay, cattle, horses, sheep, goats, okay, all these kind of ruminants, uh, they all have microorganisms in their gut that allow them to break down cellulose because cellulose is actually glucose molecules bonded to each other in such a fashion that we cannot digest it. Okay, that's why we can't eat grass. Okay, that's why we can't eat certain kinds of leaves. They have no nutritive value for us because we cannot digest the cellulose. And for us, what is cellulose? Think about it. Cellulose is indigestible, right? And it's fiber. Okay, it's fiber, and fiber is very important. So it's important to eat your vegetables and your fruits, just like your mom told you. Okay, now the second kinds of macromolecules are called lipids. Okay, they're insoluble in water. They have two times as much energy as carbohydrates and also proteins. And they are the fats and oils. Okay, fats are solid at room temperature and oils are liquid at room temperature. Okay, fats and oils are made up of glycerol molecule, which is an alcohol, and three fatty acids. Okay. And you have saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Okay, so here's a saturated fatty acid. That means that all the possible hydrogens are bonded to the carbons as possible. So that's a saturated fatty acid, which is tending to be not as healthy for us as the unsaturated fatty acids. So the unsaturated fatty acids have these double bonds between carbons, so they don't have all the hydrogens that actually can attached to them. Okay, so the unsaturated fats are supposed to be healthier for us, right? Because what they do is they don't allow them to nestle so closely and form plaques in our arteries, okay? Now waxes, okay, are solid at room temperature. They're actually made of an alcohol and fatty acids that are larger than the alcohols and the fatty acids that make up fats and oils, okay? But they're on the surface of leaves and stems. You know, if you rub a stem or a leaf, you can feel this kind of waxy substance on it, okay? So these waxes are embedded in a matrix of either cutin or suberin, okay? And this mixture, uh, this combination of waxes and cutin or waxes and suberin allows for waterproofing of the plant. It allows for decreasing of water loss of the plant, uh, decreasing dehydration of the plant, and also protection from predators such as microbes and insects. Okay. Another kind of lipid are the phospholipids. Okay, these are components of membranes. They're like a fat in terms of structure. Okay, they're actually made of glycerol. Okay, and two fatty acids. 
Okay, so these are the fatty acid tails, okay? But they also have a phosphate group where the third fatty acid would have been joined, okay? So the phospholipids are major components of membranes, all right? So here you have the polar head, which tends to be attracted to water, the phospholipid, the phospho part of the phospholipid, and the nonpolar tails toward the insides, okay? So this would be the hydrophobic environment that tends to repel water. That's why the uh, polar heads tend to be outward oriented because generally the plant and its cells and also animals and their cells tend to be in aqueous solutions. Okay, so outside the cell and inside the cell tend to be water or water-based substances. Okay. And here's a look at a cell membrane, okay, with the phospholipids, you know, with the polar heads toward the inside and the outside, and the hydrophobic tails, nonpolar tails toward the inside of the membrane. And here we have uh, proteins that span the membrane, okay, so it forms a fluid mosaic. Okay, we'll talk about more about this later. Now proteins okay, are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur, right? They regulate chemical reactions, as in enzymes. They're very large molecules, and they're made of polypeptides, okay? One or more of them, all right? So generally here is an enzyme, okay? This could be sucrase, okay? And this could be sucrose, the substrate, right? What happens, how an enzyme actually works is that the um, enzyme bonds to the substrate or binds to the substrate with an induced fit because you can see that this fit isn't exactly exact, all right? So what happens is that the substrate binds into the binding site on the um, enzyme, okay? Then it is actually changes the shape of the enzyme, which puts a stress between the two components of the substrate, and then the bonds are broken. Now these enzymes actually work under specific pH and temperature, okay? But no biochemical reaction can take place without enzymes. Okay, so the molecules of life, of course, include the proteins, right? And generally, they form chains of amino acids, 50 to 50,000 amino acids long. They're made up of polypeptides, Okay, there are 20 amino acids, and all amino acids have these components. They have the central carbon, they have the amino group, they have the carboxyl group, they have a hydrogen, and they have an R group, all connected to the central carbon. Okay, so these 20 amino acids are all exactly the same. Okay, they're all exactly the same. And here you have the central carbon, here you have the amino group, right, with the N, the nitrogen. Here you have the carboxyl group, COOH. You have a hydrogen, and then you have the R group. Between the 20 different amino acids, the only difference between them are the R groups are different between one and another of the amino acids, okay? And the amino acids actually form peptide bonds between them. They're joined by peptide bonds. And these peptide bonds are formed between the nitrogen of the amino group and the carbon of the carboxyl group, all right? So there are levels of protein structure. Okay, there's a primary structure, there's secondary structure, there's tertiary structure, and there's quaternary structure, okay? And generally, um, uh, um, we can also have denaturing going on. We'll talk about this a little bit later and about temperature and pH, all right? But first of all, the primary structure has to do with the chain of amino acids. So we see here glycine linked to another amino acid, linked to another amino acid. So these are actually the first level of protein structures, just a string of amino acids joined together, okay, between the O of the carboxyl group and the H of the amino group of the amino acid next to it, okay? The second level of protein structure has to do with the um, 
alpha helix and the beta sheets, okay, the oxygen of the carboxyl group and the hydrogen of the amino group actually forming either an alpha helix or pleated sheets or nearby uh, areas of the amino acids having relationships with each other. Tertiary structure has to do with um, the bonds between R groups uh, in different amino acids in farther apart areas from each other. So it gives the three-dimensional conformation okay, of the polypeptide. Okay, So all proteins have the first level, the second level, and the third level of protein structure. But some proteins also have quaternary structure, or the fourth level of protein structure, where the protein is made up of uh, more than one uh, polypeptide. Okay? The other thing, too, is that generally um, bonds between these R groups and bonds between uh, the hydrogen bonds between them can be disruptive okay, by changes in temperature and changes in pH. Okay? Think about boiling an egg. If you boil an egg, the white of the egg actually solidifies, yeah? That's actually losing its shape, okay, and denaturing it. Okay, now storage proteins include small amounts of proteins in potato and onion, and larger amounts in seeds, okay? And these uh, protein amounts in seeds have actually been very important to humanity for food, okay? Uh, and wheat gluten has been extremely important in terms of bread and pastas, right? And they're made of a complex of more than a dozen proteins, okay? And these proteins get used up, okay, to help germinate the seed and help the seedling to grow, okay? Now, enzymes are catalysts for chemical reactions, right? They're large and complex proteins, all right? And they tend to end in ASE, such as amylase, such as sucrase, all right? And they're a specific under specific pH and temperature. They can only function under specific pH and temperature, okay? And no biochemical reaction can take place without them, all right? So generally, enzymes have some important commercial uses, such as in waste treatment plants, in the dairy industry, and for detergent manufacturers. Okay, all these different kind of commercial applications use enzymes that are mass produced by microbes in big, huge vats. Okay. Now the nucleic acids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphate, phosphorus. Okay, they include DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's in the form of a double helix. As you can see, it's like a rope ladder twisted. And they're made up of nucleotides. Okay? And nucleotides are made up of a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. Okay? And adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. Okay, now RNA is ribonucleic acid, okay? And DNA and RNA differ from each other in terms of RNA being smaller, DNA being larger, okay? D or DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. DNA has a deoxyribosugar, RNA has a ribosugar, okay? And the bases in DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine, and in RNA, it's adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine, okay? So we talked about characteristics of life, about matter, about forms of energy, elements of cells, and the molecules of life. So that's all the time we have for us today, okay? So hopefully you enjoyed this lecture as much as I did. Aloha.